We're going live. There we go. Right. So, welcome back. Uh, we've got a um, quick succession of three talks now. Uh, so we've got John Donovan, who's going to be giving us uh, his DIY article at KGNSS. Uh, we've got Richard Kingston, who's going to do a lightning talk about forty petabytes and where we're going to be it. And then we've got um, Patrick from WSP, Patrick Reynolds. We'll be talking about uh, free and open source your spatial software within a modern consulting organization. Okay, and uh, yeah, without further ado, off we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Right, the sound of 75 people. Oh, it's, 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 it's fantastic, isn't it? Yes. So, uh, my name is John Donovan. Uh, I work for a company called Spark Geo. Uh, although this project isn't actually a Spark Geo project, it's a personal project, but it fits quite well into the Spark Geo ethos of tinkering, experimentation, uh, and things of that nature generally. Um, so a very quick bit about me. Uh, I've been programming for longer than half of you have been alive. Uh, I tinker with electronics, I've had a love for it since secondary school. Um, I've always loved maps and mapping and geospatial data and large, large vast quantities of data is my thing, point clouds and things at the moment. Uh, as you can see, I'm an occasional Viking, uh, the beard might give it away. Uh, very occasional transatlantic sailor, and that's obviously me, in the middle of the Atlantic, steering a 17-foot racing yacht. Uh, and more relevant to this, uh, an occasional archaeologist, archaeologist by training. Um, so this, this whole thing came about once I was stood in a field in Scotland. This is a field in Scotland. Uh, this is the inch tooth of Roman legionary fortress um, up near... Um, Dundee and up around that way. And so one of the so the, the, the people I work with, uh, the Roman Gas Project, we're a very small project. We uh, get funded just enough. It's usually a lot of the funding comes out of our own pockets. Uh, it tends to be a bit of a busman's holiday when we go up there, and we might get a little bit of funding from uh, Historic Scotland or, or someone like that. So this came about. This site here that I've got, you can see up here, um, Inch Tooth of uh, Legionary Fortress, is big. Um, so, sort of left to right, the, the two sort of parallel ditches, you can see the one on the left is quite clear and the one on the right is, is a uh, bit of a tree line. That's nearly 500 metres across. Uh, the whole sort of site, the whole sort of wooded site, is seven, nearly 800 metres um, from one side to the other and extends almost as far as the you can see to the back of the photograph. So it's a, this is a particularly big site. Um, because we're not a big professional archaeology unit, we don't have vast hordes of um, archaeologists fresh out of university uh, willing to work for minimum wage camping in tents. We tend to get volunteers, work volunteers, and as I say, ourselves as well. And so one of the problems we have with mapping sites like this is we use very traditional ways of mapping with tape, 30, 50 meter long tapes and pegs, which is fine for a small site. If you've got a site that's maybe 100 meters across, that's fine. When you've got something that's seven or 800 meters across and you're trying to herd enthusiastic amateurs um, and trying to teach them how to use tape, how to get horizontal distance when, um, I mean, this is relatively flat terrain, but the trench on the, on the left is actually an embankment. Um, part of the fortifications, and that's that slope is almost 45 degrees and two and a half meters high. Um, so, trying to get people to stretch a nice tape over there to try and get any sort of accuracy by the time you get to the other side of the site, if you're within a meter or two, you're you know, you're, you're laughing. And obviously, that's not ideal. I like precision, um, I'm, I'm a, I, I love it, I know it's unobtainable, but I thought we, we can do better than. Um, so still, we started looking into commercial um, high-resolution GPS or GNSS, and uh, they're, they're exceedingly expensive. They're coming down in price now. Um, MLID uh, uh, have a Reach RS2 Plus, which is about seventeen hundred, two thousand pounds per unit. Usually two of them. Uh, so 
just you know just kicking off it's, it's sort of four thousand pounds an absolute minimum if you go for something like a trimble or whatever it's like ten thousand pounds per year um and we just don't have that kind of budget in so why not do it myself how hard can it be actually it turns out quite easy these days um so these are the units that i what i built myself um so I'll, uh, I'll explain a bit more of the governs uh, inside there in a minute. Um, so I'll just very quickly go over what GNSS is. Um, so GNSS is the term that we use rather than GPS, because that's the trademark name. That's what just the American flavor of GNSS is. But you've got GLONASS, you've got Egnos, you've got all these other um, services by uh, Russians and Europeans, and Indians, Chinese, they all have Thankfully, compatible systems, or largely compatible systems. Um, it works by, as you see, trilateration, not triangulation. A lot of people say, you know, you triangulate your, your, your position with GPS, don't you? you trilaterate it. Um, what's absolutely fascinating is that at any sort of moment in time where you might have 30 or 40 satellites above your head, um, you can get the distance from your position to that satellite, to the center of the antenna, to within three or four centimeters. And that's something that's tens, hundreds of thousands of meters away. I mean, it's, you know, it's, the, the distances involved are incredible. Um, one of the problems you have though, which is why the GPS in your phone can only get you sort of maybe three meters if you're lucky, five to 10 meters um, nominally, is uh, mainly due to tropospheric delay. Uh, so that's quite simply, so the troposphere from the ground up to 6,000 meters, 6, meters, 9,000 meters, something like that. Um, that refract, refracts the radio waves. So the satellites will broadcast their, um, their timing uh, signals um, and GPS normally works by saying, well, how long is it taking for that signal to get from the satellite to where I am? Uh, Divide by the speed of light, that's your distance. Fortunately, um, in the same way the atmosphere refracts visible light, it also reflect, refracts um, the, uh, the, the signals we get from the satellite. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, modeling that is incredibly difficult. Um, something that's thankfully you don't have to worry too much about, you have to be aware of. Um, and so, it adds a few extra steps, but that's why you're unlikely to ever get really super, super accurate. Uh, positioning on your mobile phone. Um, so it requires a bit of um, post-processing. So we've got, you get raw data coming from the satellites, raw time data, raw distance data. Uh, quite interestingly, actually, we know where the satellites are more accurately now because they're all over the world. There are a series of fixed base stations. We know where they are on the Earth. We can actually, uh, we, they can model the, the drops rate delay and actually figure out where the satellites are to much more accurate accuracy than just having their orbital parameters, which can change. Um, so you get all this, this scads of data coming down uh, and usually you have to uh, post-process it. So you've got PPP, post-processing post positioning. Uh, so you get a couple of megabytes of data over a series of maybe six, eight hours or even longer, ideally. Um, upload it to uh, one of these services. Canada has a really good um, service, just a load of data. Five, 10 minutes later, they'll send you a PDF of your position. Um, PPK works kind of similar. Um, in, so in fact, what I'll do is I'll move on to base stations. So the idea is you have a base station, which in this case is this, um, and you need to know where that is. In the world, so you tend to stick that on the tripod, leave it for six, eight hours, gather all the data, do PPP, figure out where it is, and that gets you. So, usually within about three centimeters, the longer you leave it, the better. Then, um, and that always stays fixed. And then you have the rover, which is a very cleverly marked rover in this case, um, and that's the bit that walks around with you when you're actually doing the surveying. And the idea is that uh, they, the two units communicate with each other over radio, and you make the assumption that the tropospheric delay is the same for both 
units, more than a few kilometers apart. Um, and so the rover can get its position accurately because we know exactly where the base station is. Uh, position is two jumpers delays that cancel out and uh, you get nice accurate positioning. Um, but you still often need to do some post-processing, so PPK, um, not something I've used, but the idea is you sort of gather the data on both units as if it was sort of live and you won't actually get a live position. You then take both units data back, post-process it, and then you get your track. It's used a lot in sort of, um, you know, particularly in some, uh, vehicles for processing data markets. And then you've got RTK, which is what people mostly know about, uh, or heard of, and that's real-time kinematics. That's what I was saying, where both units will um, communicate with each other on the radio. And uh, um, two delays cancel out, so you know where you are. So I thought I'd have a go at it myself. So my expert photography here, is this, is, uh, this is what I knocked together um, over the course of a few weeks, I suppose, on and off. Um, it all started, I was looking for a cheap GPS unit, uh, RTK unit, and uh, again, the sort of most popular, sort of hobbyist one is uh, made by Ublox. Um, they're fairly expensive, uh, sort of 200 pounds-ish for that green rectangle up in the top left corner, the equivalent of. I found a company called uh, Navspark, uh, based out of Taiwan, and they uh, produced that unit for about 100 pounds, so roughly half the price of Ublock's system, um, which is great. So the, the sort of slight disadvantage with that, of course, is that um, on their forums and their emails, they're not too bad at communicating. But if you go online and actually sort of, you know, try and look for any help on using uh, NavSpark stuff, good luck with that. Um, there's, there's no tag on Stack Overflow. Um, so I initially bought this, the, the, that green board, <coughs> initially bought that, about 100 pounds, shipped over from Taiwan. Bought myself a survey grade antenna, which is one of these things. Also about hundred pounds. Everything costs about sort of hundred pounds. Um, hooked it up, and um, away I went. And yes, for uh, getting your uh, setting up a, a base station, that's fine. You can get some data out of it. Um, but I wanted to go a little bit further and have a rover and a base station. Um, also, the, uh, the problem is with this board is the actual bit that does the, the GPS stuff is that tiny white square at the top of the green rectangle. That's it, that's the GPS bit. The silver bit just below it um, is a microcontroller with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, which just handles some serial data in and out. That's all it does. It just takes the data from that GPS chip and, and squirts out of Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or one of the USB ports. I thought about using that to do some more processing. And I said, uh, so you've got the source code for that? And they said, nope. And we just buy them in bulk. They've got some basic source code on and we stick them on the board and that's it. So I thought, well, I could hijack that because it's a very powerful processor and it's not actually doing very much. But what I didn't want to do is uh, overwrite the code that's in there and brick my 100 pound uh, unit. So that's why this one looks a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Um, so the process on the board isn't actually doing anything at all. Uh, for the most part, I use it for, the, for Bluetooth. Um, a battery down there, uh, just next to the battery is the power board that handles um, the charging and all the power management. Um, the long rectangular board, blue board to the right, that's the actual um, microcontroller that does all the Sort of processing that I need to do, which again isn't a great deal. Um, and then the board above it is uh, a LoRa radio module. So that's the long range radio module running 868 megahertz um, that actually communicates with the base station. That's a better view of it. That's the back of it. Um, so I, I, I wish I'd used different colored wires. 
um, for different different things. Uh, but I try to be as neat as possible because when you're working on perf board like this, um, it's very easy to create a rat's nest. So that took a fair bit of um, of bending bits of wire, installing them, and desoldering them, and all that sort of stuff. Base station looks very similar. I ended up buying another unit. Uh, so that green board there is just the uh, RTK GPS unit, GNSS unit. Um, that's also about hundred pounds, just slightly cheaper than the, uh, than the other one. Um, and that's great because that meant I could actually do all the processing myself. Um, so this layout of the board is kind of broadly similar. You've got power management the bottom left, you've got the, the RF stuff for communication the top left, and then you've got the brain box, which is an ESP32 um, in the top right. And that does all the processing. Um, slightly more complicated underneath. Um, takes a memory card, an SD card. Uh, there's some voltage power management and stuff under that. A bit of electricity just tape just to make sure it doesn't short out in the case. Um, right, so the cost. Uh, so yeah, so an Emily, Emily Reach RS2 Plus is about £1,700 each. Um, they are actually doing really great things at bringing the cost down. They realise that actually there's been a lot of, sort of scalping going on with all the big companies, all the top, com, uh, top cons and trimbles and all, all those sorts of people, um, reassuringly expensive, whereas actually the Emily stuff, the stuff is fantastic, um, but I don't have £3,500. Uh, so the broad cost of, of each unit that I've made is about 300 pounds. Um, more or less, uh, it's difficult to, to sort of get an absolute figure on it because um, mistakes were made. So the first mistake was one of these things. So this is uh, the, the radio antenna that communicates between the base station and the rover. <coughs> Always look at the spec sheet for anything that you're buying um, online if you can't see it in person. Um, I looked at specs and this is this is good. I thought, brilliant, this is much better than the, than the, than the next bit. So I'll pay a little bit more to get a better antenna. What I didn't look at is the length. This is 30 centimeters. What I should have got really is sort of is a uh, quarter of that length. Um, so this becomes a little bit unwieldy. Not the end of the world, but, um, and actually the radio pattern is actually not ideal either. Um, so I later found out, but um i could still get at least a kilometer distance between rover and base station um i tried that from one end of a reservoir to the other and seemed to get a perfectly good signal it will go even further i did kind of crank it up to 11 which is technically illegal um but as it was it was uh, an experiment so it's fine it's fine um the dev board so i paid that extra, paid a little bit extra for the dev board um that i never really used um because the, 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 the process on it doesn't really do anything. Um, the ports to, to plug, so it's very important which antenna you plug into which hole. And uh, it seemed like a good idea to get two, uh, two, two ports the same. There's all various different standards. There's a big one and a small one, and there's loads of ones. But these, I got two small ones, which means you have to be very careful which one you plug in, because if you plug the wrong antenna in, you can end up blowing the, the radio module. Um, another problem I had because I was using two different uh, microcontrollers um, that I had to have two different code bases plus the code on the mobile phone to actually deal with the uh, actually getting the data off the rover. Um, so I ended up having to sort of have together three different uh, code bases one's in MicroPython, one's in C, and the other one's in um, JavaScript. And uh, so that was a bit of a pain. Um, so I definitely wouldn't be doing that again uh, if I had the time and inclination to, to rebuild it, which I might do one day. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I never really did get quite the precision I wanted. I still got about three centimeters, roughly, which for archaeological purposes is absolutely fine. Um, we can actually use total stations and things like that for more accurate surveying from a given point once we know where that point is. And that's it. Thank you. Well, uh, Kirsty does a bit of uh, finagling for the next stream. We've got time for a question. Is there anyone want to ask me? Um, 
So, so the question was, have I open source any of this? No, because it's it's awful. Um, and I could do it if you want it. It's fine. It's very specific to these two modules and, and it's packed together enough so that it works. Um, more than welcome, should you want to have a look at it. It's, yeah, it's, there's nothing particularly innovative in it. It's mostly dealing with some state on the base and dealing with some radio communications uh, between two modules. And then on the mobile phone side, it's um, just sucking in some data from Bluetooth. Um, so, uh, but yeah, and the same, same goes for the hardware. It's mostly put together as Lego. So um, I could open source it if you really wanted, but it's not too open. It's better off just talking to it. If you scrap the world, you improve the accuracy of the phone. So the question was, uh, if you strap it to a drone, can you improve orthophotos? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that is one of the things I want to do. I mean, this rover, you know, these are uh, anodized aluminium case, they're not quite hard, and it's, it's got a, a quite heavy, it's got a fairly big battery in it, and these things are quite heavy, but you can get smaller survey grade antennas, um, and so it wouldn't take too much to drone. And uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, that's one of the things I want to do because I like my drones and taking all the photos. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, build in GPS. Yes, so, so, thanks. Sorry, another question. If you, if you can do this for whatever it is, a tenth or something of the price of what a commercial group can do it for, do they ensure that you let them know if they break the wire or anything? Yeah, so the question was, you know, if. Uh, if I can do it for 300 pounds, why can't they? Um, again, I think it's a sort of, uh, it's a sort of reassuringly expensive thing. I mean, if I put in my time as well, then something else that the cost goes up. There's no support for it. It's just something that I've done myself. So I, I suspect MLID are pretty much on, you, you couldn't really realistically get much cheaper than MLID these days. Um, you know, a small startup might be able to, but then you want to factor start factoring into support costs and that sort of thing. And user, uh, it's all sort of, you know, for, for people who don't know what they're doing and just want to switch on a device and run a bit of software and capture some points, that would require an awful lot more work. This is basically a dirty business. Yes, but I suspect you couldn't do it for much less than anything. Yeah, driving on time a little bit, so I think we've got one final question. Actually, it's not being asked. Oh, I was going to ask about what the numbers uh, are your time being the person to yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, these are sort of, you know, exploratory, so it's sort of weekends and evenings. Um, so it's sort of happened on and off over the course of a couple of months. I suppose if I was doing it for a job and I had to sort of start from, from scratch, it, I would say probably about sort of three weeks to kind of get a working prototype up that sort of, um, that sort of level. So yeah, 120 hours, 100, 150 hours, something like those lines, just get basically. If you have a clue, I had to do an awful lot of reading as well, so that adds a lot of time, um, a lot of experimentation, a lot of cursing. <laughs> um, although some of that time does include making a learning case for it as well, which is a pleasant Saturday. Um, to start talking on the presentation, uh, I have a question while, while that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> you on site surveying the ecosystem of the market. What's the actually how to do it? Like, um I yes it, it could certainly be um and again we were mostly just collecting points um so the question was about sort of feasibility of, of doing sort of greater sort of data collection and analysis yeah we were mostly just sort of collecting points corners of buildings that sort of thing um and then going back to base afterwards putting it to QGIS or even to Whatever to, uh, uh, and then sort of doing some manual sort of work after that. But certainly there's plenty of scope and there's a lot of um, software out there. It's designed mostly for civil surveying. Um, so if you're doing roads and buildings and that sort of thing is what most of the software is designed for, which doesn't necessarily suit an archaeological use case all the time. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so there's there's plenty of potential. Um, the main difficulty was actually getting the data in the first place and verifying its accuracy. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we've developed a hilarious problem. <laughs>